speeches, each speaker will speak in impromptu on a nominated topic. First speaker is James Cox. Good morning teachers, fellow super intellects and other things. I'm here to tell you about a well-known fairy tale, one called The Tragedy of Televisions. Once upon a time, in a galaxy far, far away, lived a species who called themselves humanoids. One family in particular, the Roosters family, had recently undergone a dreadfully savage tragedy. Their television had been destroyed. It happened one day, in the year 1990, <coughs> the four Roosters kids had just arrived home from a place called school when they saw the television lying face down on the floor. That's odd, said the one called Kate. It was on the cupboard when I left this morning. And look, the window is open and the curtain drawn. It wasn't like this at all. Suspicions arose at once. Nobody could trust anybody anymore. They were all dejected, devastated and doomed. Forced to live out their lives without the comforting presence of television. You must realise, of course, that each of the Roosters' kids were afflicted in different ways. For instance, the one called Victoria was forced to read her first book past 50 pages. Penny, the romanticist drama queen, took to writing heartbreaking, tear-jerking letters and poems to condole herself. Kate, ever the responsible one, took it upon herself to find the vandal. Apparently, she had narrowed it down to three million. You can imagine how they felt and reacted when, being told of the cause of so many tears, their mother was completely and utterly positive of the gone television. No, I will not pay for its repair, she said. I will not have you pay either, nor one. I don't care if you die from it. Knowing you, you'll probably survive. Look, the only one who is dead is a television, and you'll have to live without it. I'll not have you turning into mindless zombies by watching with eyes glued to the screen of that idiot box. Let's get back to the story, shall we? Oh, they had tough times, those roosters kids, especially in a place called school. Humanoids giggled and pointed, teased and insulted them. The one called Victoria remarked, they really are stupid imbeciles. They probably couldn't tell the difference between a television and a microwave. I must agree, said the drama queen Penny, that they would not know the hardships of not owning a television. Hey guys, said Kate, James and I have just thought of a really good plan. Gather round and listen. And so they did. It was a rather clever ploy. The next time someone came up and asked, Did you watch The Simpsons' whole new episode last night? The Roosters' kids saw a surprise them by saying yes. They'd have a puzzled expression on their face when they asked, But you don't have a television, do you? Why? The Roosters' kids would reply, If you'd known the technological advancement of today, you'd known that we watched normal television programs on our microwave. Alas, that brought more of the mocking than the much hoped for peace and quiet. Five years later, the Roosters kids were faced with some good and bad news. The good, they'd be getting a television. The bad, they wouldn't be able to watch it. I hope you enjoyed that fairy tale. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Year 7, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'll be talking to you about water pollution. All water on the earth is bombarded with pollutants. Sea animals have to live in it and humans have to drink it. Rain and rivers wash our wastes into lakes and seas where it slowly builds up. Natural process can remove some, but by no means all the pollutants that household and industrial waste contains. Ocean dumping is the ultimate in, out of sight, out of mind waste disposal. Did we really expect the oceans to swallow and digest 
the 20 billion tonnes of waste that we have dumped into our waters. The experts, they said it would be okay. And we didn't argue until the tide finally turned and we began to see for ourselves the oily globs, the raw sewerage, the sickly fish, and the armada of plastics which was washing up onto our favourite beaches. The policy of dumping sewerage and industrial waste directly offshore means that coastal and estuarine areas show signs of pollution. Unfortunately, these same waters are very valuable to us as sources of most of our fish, prawns and other seafoods. The remaining 90% of ocean is largely a biological desert supporting relatively few forms of life. There is more to ocean pollution than just outfalls. Toxic waste is dumped far out to sea, creating problems for the future generations. Containers of radioactive waste have been deposited on the Atlantic deep seabed, and plastic and other rubbish is being thrown overboard from ships at a rate of 1.1 to 1.6 kilos per crew member per day. Multiply this by the number of crew sailing the ocean at any one time, and this amounts to a lot of rubbish from just one source. Then, there are toxic chemicals dumped directly into the sea or deposited as fallouts from huge incinerate ships, which are specially designed to burn hazardous wastes at sea. Oil leaks from the seabed can occur naturally. However, human humanity's contribution to ocean pollution far exceeds this amount. Sources include large volumes of waste, oil from machines and ship engines, blowouts from offshore drilling sites, pipeline leaks, and most publicised of all, oil tanker spills. Recently, the world witnessed the worst oil spill in living history when the tanker Exxon Valdez ran aground in Prince William Sound, Alaska. A sequence of human errors, alleged drunken captain, an unqualified third mate at the helm, and grossly <coughs> inadequate contingency plans resulted in the spilling and spread of over 240,000 barrels of oil into one of the richest wildlife areas in North America. Humans use large quantities of water. Not only do we drink it, we use it to, to washing. We irrigate gardens and farm crops. We use it to flush away waste in the sewerage system. Many human activities leave water dirty and sometimes full of dangerous, unwanted and dangerous chemicals. How to stop this problem is one of the biggest problems we now face. If humans cared more, I'm sure there would be less water pollution. Thank you. Good morning teachers and fellow students. Today I would like to talk about the Royal Alexandra Children's Hospital. Recently I was a patient there myself when the hospital was at Camperdown, but this month they moved to Westmead. The people at Royal Alexandra, they take great care of you. They try their best to make your stay there fun and enjoyable. There are a lot of wards in the hospital. I was in two wards. For the first two weeks I was in William Stewart and for the last week I was in adolescent. First I'd better tell you why I was in there. You most probably noticed me hobbling around the school, either on crutches or a big ugly splint on my leg. I went there for three weeks treatment of hydrotherapy and physiotherapy. William Stewart is the best ward. The nurses let you stay up to as late as you like. Well, some of the nurses anyway. Paul, John and I normally stayed up to 1, 2 o'clock in the morning watching videos, then slept in the next morning. I'll tell you about John and Paul later. The three most popular things at the hospital are Radio Bedrock, the Starlight Express Room and the coffee shop, where they serve real food. First I'll tell you about Radio Bedrock. After dinner, which is 5 o'clock, we would head up to the studio of Radio Bedrock, a radio station in the hospital. We would listen to all the latest songs and the occasional bananas and pajamas for the little kids. You can talk on the radio with Ivan or one of the other DJs too. Radio Bedrock is what all kids look forward to during the day. 
Dexter is the Starlight Express Room. The Starlight Room is funded by the Starlight Foundation. The Starlight Foundation raises money for the hospital. The Starlight Room has video games, a TV with a huge screen, and catering, and you can make catering and bookmarks out of leather. You can play the keyboard and a whole lot of other stuff too. On Thursdays, Bill Bong, the cartoonist, comes in and draws you a cartoon picture of yourself. What I looked forward to during the day was when I went to swimming, hydrotherapy, and seeing Karina. Karina was my physiotherapist. She was the one who helped me get back on my feet and walking around again. And Marion, she is my physiotherapist in Barrel. They are both really nice. Sometimes if you're really lucky, you get to meet celebrities. I met Jim Owen, Hammer of Gladiators, and David Campisi, and a few other people. Now I'll tell you about John, Paul, and a few other people I met. I'll start with John. John is 10 years old. He was in a hit and run and broke both of his legs. It was a bad break too. He was in an attraction for a while, then he had two plaster casts with pins in his legs. That followed with a lot of hydrotherapy and physiotherapy. He was in hospital for around about five months. All I can remember about what happened was that it was a red Commodore and that they revved up and charged for him. John is the mom, so it is believed that it was a racist attack against him. Jonah has the greatest sense of humor for what he has been through. <coughs> Next there is Paul. Paul is 14. He had tumors in his back and leg. Paul and Johnny were best mates when they were in hospital. Paul annoyed most of the nurses, and me sometimes too. Well, most of the time. And there's Scotty. Scott's leg was six centimeters smaller than the other. Scott lives in Maryland too. Scott and John would often have wheelchair races up and down the hallway. But Scott could barely reach the wheels to push himself along. It was funny to watch because John would go straight ahead and Scott would be off in all other directions because he could not control the wheelchair. And there's also Annalise. She was two years old. She was really cute. She had a blood clot in her brain. Children like these kids are no different from you and me. They laugh like you and me. They have all the same feelings as all of us here today. Their stories goes to show how lucky we really are and how we should take good health for granted. Thank you for listening. <laughs> With a personal combat without weapons, not usually relying on muscular strength, but relies upon balance and leverage. Judo was invented toward the end of the 19th century by a nobleman of Tokyo called Professor Jiro Kano, who collected many of the simple techniques of another martial art called Jiu-Jitsu into a new system to which we now know as Judo. In competition, you can beat an opponent by throwing them over your shoulder or hip using a judo technique similar to this, tripping up your opponent like this, or if you and your opponent both fall, you can pin them down on the mat for 30 seconds. Each fighting bout goes to two minutes, and after that the winner gets a certain number of points, depending on how well he or she through or pin their opponent. The point ranges are 10 points, 5 points, 3 points, 2 points and 1 point. If neither of the opponents manages to throw or pin one another, usually the person who has done the most attacking gets between 3 and 1 points. Then you fight the other people in your group. When everyone has had a fighting bout against everyone in their group, the points are tallied up and every and the person with the most points is the winner. These groups are determined on your age, weight, sex, and the grade you are in the judo. Now, these groups can have up to 10 people in them, but the most I have ever fought is five. The colour of your belt determines the grade you are in at judo. The order of colours are white, beginners level, yellow, grade one, orange, grade two, green, grade three, blue, grade four, brown, grade five, and then six grades black. To get these grades, you must go through a special grading. <coughs> For that, you must do a certain number of throws and hold downs, depending on your age and the grade you are going for. You also have to do strangle holds for ground and black. Sometimes during classes and in competition, some Japanese language is used instead of English. Some of these words are rei, bow, ajime, stop fighting, bate, stop, if I'm with one hand, I can to one player, means the player is one, and sensei, memory, ray, 
about your senses. At the end of my judo class, I bow to my teacher, so this is how I will finish my speech. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the city descent. First, I'll give some history, then I'll talk about what happened this year. The starting gun for Sydney's first city descent was fired on the town hall step in 1971. It started off as a small race with only 2,025 runners, but boy has it grown. This year, around 50,000 people entered the city set. It was also the 20th anniversary, which made it even more special. Back when it started, it was not a big thing. Uh, in 1973, only 4,005 people entered. They had to keep moving the starting line to give room for the runners. As the years went on, the numbers went through the roof. In 1976, 10,000 people entered. In 1978, 20,000 people. In 1983, 30,000 people. And in 1990, 43,240. In 1992, they had to have three different starting times to give room for all the people. They also decided to let the more serious people go first. The City to Surf is one of the biggest races in Australia. Not only Aussies enter, people from the US, New Zealand, Hong Kong and Japan. This year, in the series groups, the favourites were Paul Arthur and Pat Carroll, but neither of these won an African man did. Heather Turland, who some of you might know, was the first lady to cross the finishing line last year, but this year she only went in for fun with the kids because she had a broken pelvis. City to Surf is 14 kilometres long, and they block the streets beforehand. It starts in High Park and goes through King's Cross, Edgecliff, Rose Lake, Royal Clues and finishes at Bondo, going near the water the whole way. The hardest part of the whole course is Heartbreak Hill. It's very steep and it seems to go forever, but at the top there's a great view of the whole harbour. This year, my dad and I decided to walk it at the last minute. It was $30 for adults and $15 for children, so we didn't register. Along the way, there are six drink stations and you grab a cup, take a drink and just drop it, and after the race, officials pick up your mess. Along the way, there are bands and heaps of stereos. People have parties. You couldn't see behind you where the people stopped coming. The atmosphere is really great. People in wheelchairs and mugs pushing strollers went in it too. People in dinner suits, Batman and Catwoman costumes, and gorilla costumes went in it. We didn't actually start six to 600 metres behind the starting line, so we didn't actually cross the starting line until 20 past 10, not 10 o'clock. It was a really hot day. We passed one person in oxygen masks, a person getting resuscitated, and heaps of people with first aid people. At the end, there were bands and heaps of ice cream machines. I had blistered feet, but it was a really good day. Thank you. Themselves. 
because they had been hand-fed for a long period of time and they might die. Thanks for listening to me today and remember, don't harm or kill animals. Who was the speaker just before our last speaker? Who was the person who spoke just before our last speaker? What was her name? Megan Gibbons. Welcome fellow students. I'm here today to talk about sports. My first sport will be football. Football is roughly a game where a bunch of two teams run it out and bunch, punch each other's heads in. Um, but, it is, but it is a very skilled game. Oh, it's pretty skilled anyway. I played it for four years so I couldn't be that skilled. Um, yeah, so, um, firstly, the game starts off with a kick-off, run, tackle, punch me in the head, and do it over again. <laughs> um, my second sport is baseball. Baseball, it's a pretty good, fast game. It's just it's like um, football, but you've got to um, chuck the ball at the head, and um, you've got to try and hit home run. And softball is like nearly the same but you have to throw it underarm and it's a much slower game. T-ball is for the little and kids like who like aren't really that skilled yet and like it's really funny watching them. And then there's BMX riding. The BMX race goes for about 15, oh man, about 60 seconds. It's a combination of tabletops, triples, ditches and whatever else you can think of to kill yourself. <laughs> then there's ice hockey, it's about the same, you get a bunch of pads on and bring people into the wall, you hit the ball around to try and get <coughs> into the goal and hit people with your hockey stick. Wave hockey is nearly the same but you're on the cement and then you hurt more. Then there's rock climbing, I'd hate to do that because most of the time I'm not that good at climbing so I'd fall off and kill myself. <laughs> but if that'd be pretty hard, you've got to have a lot of upper strength body body strength and you've got to be able to like to tell where to climb and that. Then there's martial arts. That's uh, I reckon it'd be okay. It's not as you'd think it'd be like to punch each other's heads in it's an actually skilled game. It's not to like hurt people, it's to protect yourself. Hockey is for a mixture for boys and girls. It's an okay game if you don't want any of your shins. Okay. Oh, then there's soccer, I don't like that very much, but you still get your shins kicked and you get a sore headache after you head off the ball. Okay, thank you for listening to me.
was also drawing closer to the opening night of the school spectacular Alice in Wonderland. Sport and theatre may seem to have very little in common, but you may be surprised. Many of the actor type have little or no interest in active sports whatsoever, but some members of our mixed hockey team would certainly not be caught dead dressed in a costume and made a complete and utter fool of themselves on stage. So what are the links? I have played a part or role in both. The preparation is often the most challenging and rewarding. Commitments are to be kept, and training or rehearsal schedules often consumes a lot of your spare time. If the preparation process fails, then there is no use performing or putting on a good show. The tension and stress before a game or a perform performance is extraordinary. Each child has a different way of dealing or coping with the task, and some can be quite amusing. The tapping of hockey sticks on chin pads, the amount of extra consumed before the whistle even blows, and of course the nervous lead role pacing up and down and biting her fingernails, <coughs> waiting for her magical moment of her stage debut. Whether it be on a field or on the stage, the nervous feeling in the air is evident and quite strong. But, when the whistle blows or the curtain draws, everything slots into place and continues anyway. But that is why preparation is so important. When the half-time whistle blows, you start to wonder why you ever started in the first place and get encouraged by the eager coach to press on and be enthusiastic. Get hungry, as some loyal supporters would say. At interval, the frustrated director of the play would verbally abuse the disobedient child who has missed his cue and therefore forgotten his lines. Neither are very pleasant to be in at the time, but are similar in peculiar ways. The next is probably the most joyous or disheartening feeling you could possibly experience, the after-match or performance celebrations. The anguish among the team or cast all subsides the team or cast are now as one. Postscript. Alice in Wonderland was a resounding success. A tour de force. Rave reviews. Curtain calls. PPS. Mittagong flogged us in the grand final 5-1. Oh well, I suppose there's always next year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today I'll be talking to you about rainforest and how tremendous logging in the past has a big impact for our future. Since 1978, 80% of all rainforests have been chopped down, leaving 20% remaining. The reason for this is that in their days, farmers needed more room for crops and for farm uses. They also cut the rainforest down for red cedar, which there was a lot of. It was worth more than gold, and it was good for making furniture out of. These days there's not a lot of red cedar left. In result of the tremendous logging in the past, rainforests in Australia are now protected. The Great Forest region covers a region of Eastern Colombia in a vast area of Peru would be more untouched than it is if it were not for rubber sneakers. The pursuit of this product have made their way into the forest where rivers have cut their path through the dense growth. The rainforest is the only home that animals have and if we keep going on the way we are, we lose all our wildlife and animals. Example: The koala's home is at stake. It's been its tree is being chopped down every day just so we can make more money. Soon there'll be no more koalas. Birds, they nest in trees. We chop them down, <coughs> and we keep doing this. The colourful birds will leave, and we lose our wildlife. The rabbits, the rabbits nest in logs and trees. Take them away and the rabbits flee. No more rabbits. The monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Chop them down and the monkeys cannot get away from its predator. 
because there's no trees to swing from. In conclusion, as you can see, how over the years we have destroyed our lovely rainforest. Thank you for listening. Greenpeace helps a lot of the world's problems, whether it's a tangled dolphin in a net or nuclear bombs. Good morning, girls and boys of Year 7. Today I'd like to talk to you about Greenpeace. Greenpeace has a boat called the Rainbow Warrior, which helps Greenpeace when it has to go over to other parts of the world to protest. But in 1985, the Rainbow Warrior was bombed in Auckland Harbour by the French. One man, Benito Pereira, was killed just the day before his birthday. Then in 1989, another Rainbow Warrior was built and was launched in Hamburg, Germany. Greenpeace started in 1971 in Canada and was just a small group, but now is the biggest environmental organisation in the world, with over 5 million supporters worldwide. At the moment, Greenpeace are on their way to our at Muroa, helping to protest against the French nuclear testing in the Pacific. Some ships and helicopters that Greenpeace have are the MV Greenpeace, which is 58 metres long, the Moby Dick, which is 10 metres long, the Solo, which is 67.4 metres long, the Rainbow Warrior, which is 55.2 metres long, and a helicopter. This helicopter has a pilot called Paula Huckleberry, who several times flew between Norwegian harpoonists and whales in an attempt to stop the whales from being killed. <laughs> A mother whale, due to have a baby, was found by Norwegian harpoonists. The poor whale had harpoons thrown at her until eventually one harpoon pierced into her skin. Then she was pumped full of air to stay afloat on the water and was left to bleed to death in the water and then cut up on the boat. Doesn't this make you feel sick? This is one scene Greenpeace came across when they were over in Norway protesting against the harpooning of whales. You can become a Greenpeace supporter, a friend of the Rainbow Warriors, or just make a donation. 10% of the money you donate will go to administration. 32% will go to fundraising costs. 58% will go to campaigning, public information, education, etc. So far, in the 24 years Greenpeace has existed, they have achieved a number of important goals. They've decreased the amount of seal pups being killed for their skins by 10%. Stopped nuclear waste from being poured into the oceans. Banned toxic waste being put into the sea. Banned toxic trade. Made stricter controls on dumping our in industrial pollution in our coastal waters. Reduce the amount of drift nets being put into the sea because they're at risk to dolphins and marine life. Made a 50 year ban on mining in Antarctica. Established a southern ocean whale sanctuary. Stopped Jervis Bay from being turned into a naval base. Are now working with the government on the year 2000 Green Games. And they've created a fridge which is called which is ozone layer friendly, which means that chemicals in the fridge aren't harm harmful to the ozone layer. This fridge is called the green fridge. Thank you. Our paddy horse is in a brook adjacent to Kalongalook. One evening he said to his wife, My dear, I like this quiet life. The noise and bustle of the town, where trams and buses knock one down, does not appeal to me at all. I'd rather watch a waterfall. Why do men fret and fume and fuss when they might live in peace like us? <laughs> Indeed, my love, his wife replied, men's foolishness can't be denied. Why run a risk with trams and buses? when they might live like patty pusses. <laughs> well, I must say I agree with the platypus's views on cities. 
The most important differences between city and country are the essentials in life, namely clean water to drink, clean air to breathe and peace and quiet. How long is it since you have drunk a glass of that poisonous chlorinated substance that Sydney ciders call water? Or attempted to breathe the gritty mixture of poisonous gases that they call air? Or try to get a good night's sleep with the gentle lullabies of roaring traffic, police sirens and low-flying jets dinging in your ears? Compare all these horrors to tasting a glass of pure fresh water from a mountain stream and smelling and breathing in the air and smelling of the clean country air and smelling the scents of eucalyptus, new pow newly ploughed earth and new mown hay in the quiet of the countryside. There is more freedom in the country too. For instance, you can make noises without disturbing the rest of the neighbourhood. You can practice music, sing songs or even chuck a tantrum in the middle of the paddock without anybody giving you strange looks. Hardly anybody, anyway. And there is also a lot less crime in the country, <coughs> so you can step out the front door with no immediate fear of a cut throat. Also, there is a lot stronger sense of community in the country. You are a person with a name, that name known to nearly everybody in the district, not just one of the city's anonymous mob. And in addition, there is room to move in the country. The football fanatics can indulge in their pastime without breaking the neighbour's windows, and you can get all the exercise you want. The country is also a lot more pleasant to be in. What could be more enjoyable than riding your horse down quiet country lanes? Or an early morning ramble through the paddocks, watching the sky turn pink with dawn and listening to the magpies caroling? Or actually being able to see the wondrous glory of the everlasting stars that Banjo Patterson wrote about? What can you see at night in the city? Neon signs, mostly. In the daylight, the city dweller sees encouraging things such as someone else's drab grey brick wall that divides their pocket handkerchief garden from the next, or rubbish floating in some nauseating green scum covered canal. Of course, the country is not perfect. One of the most serious blemishes is the huge hordes of city tourists that invade the country on weekends and every other day, bringing their city habits with them. They zoom aimlessly around at high speeds, whatever could they see doing 100 kilometres an hour, and throw rubbish out of their car windows, which, much to our disgust, we country bumpkins have to clean up. <laughs> Scientific studies have proved the general health of people who live in the city is much lower than people who live in the country. And the level of lead and other heavy metals is a lot higher in city people than in country people. Lifestyle is a matter of my preference. My own interests include things such as exploring nature, bushwalking and riding horses. All these things are difficult to do in the city. If the Swiss city dweller, dweller hates his neighbours, he has a problem. But in the country, you can have all the pleasure of a feud with your neighbours without it affecting your lifestyle much, because you live further away from them. Hostile neighbours in town can pop out like jack in the boxes before you have time to duck for safety. <laughs> People from large cities buy weekend properties in Burrowing, a village near my home, and I dislike them importing their crummy lifestyles to the country. Their gate intercoms and electric toothbrushes should be where they belong, in the city. <laughs> One famous English writer referred to cities as when. That means boils, a huge infected sore. Gosh, I couldn't have put that better myself. <laughs>
too hard to work out that we're going to run out of time this morning. Uh, and therefore, the most important thing, I guess, for most people, the result, we can't give you today. So, what we're going to have to do, and because there, there is equal waiting for the impromptu and the prepared speech, I don't really think it would be a good idea for me to say uh, such and such a person has got this number of marks for their prepared speech. Uh, I think it's much better if we wait until the, the impromptus have been done, the marks have been tallied, because, for instance, somebody who did very well in a prepared speech may not do so well in the impromptu, and vice versa. So, I'm sorry about that. I didn't realise we were going to have quite as many, many uh, speakers, and the assembly this morning, which was also a bit of a surprise, we didn't know that that assembly was going to be on, which meant that we lost uh, over 10 minutes at the beginning. If we'd had that 10 minutes, I think we should have, we probably would have been able to do the impromptus today. Uh, so, what will be happening, you might be interested in this carry out the same as everyone else. What will be happening is that these people who've spoken today will be taken out of class one day um, early next week, and a, an English class for Year 7 will be the impromptu audience. Now, Mrs. Pavia and I have decided that uh, we really don't think that uh, Year 7's performance today as an, as an audience has really warranted taking everyone out of class and giving them the privilege of listening to the final. That may be harsh on probably the three quarters of the audience who've done the right thing, but without mentioning any names, Scott Lee, <laughs> Brian Raybol, because he's not even looking at the front now. And I guess it's a bit unfair for me to think about Scott and Brian because they've got plenty of mates. Thrill of a lifetime. Well, there are different ways to be thrilled. And if I had one wish to be thrilled in a way, I would choose to go on a round the world trip. First, I would start by going around Australia. And then I would go to the other countries like America, France, England, and um, the West Indies. Then I would also take my family and friends. In conclusion, I would not waste my wish on tip terms or anything like that. Thank you. Thanks, Lena. Good morning, teachers and fellow students. Today I will be talking about what I think will be the thrill of a lifetime. I reckon it would be jumping out of a plane, with a parachute, of course. I think it would be so fun to jump out of a plane. I really can't think of anything else to say, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We all go searching for our lifetime thrill. Sometimes we are successful and find it. Sometimes, sometimes we never do. For some people, seeing famous people such as the Prime Minister or the film stars they say they're in love with are their greatest thrills. For others, reveling in the delights of science, maths, and other things. Other people get their delights from all sorts of weird things. For example, bungee jumping, I never do that, and watching violent movies on television. For my part, I must say I get my thrills from riding horses and anything else to do with horses. Thank you. And cops. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Madam Duke here. This impromptu is about the thrill of a lifetime. As interesting as it seems, this speech is quite hard, and at the moment I'm just filling in time. Back to the subject. The thrills that I can think of are hmm, standing on top of Kosciuszko after a 8k climb, floating down a Mount Beauty stream on rubber tubing, and it's sort of like a waterfall thing. It's really fun. Speaking to at the moment, although that is a rather nerve-wracking thing, um, that's really all I can remember. But I assure you that there are others. 
What are your thrills of lifetimes? Can you remember them? Try. Think hard. Thank you. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'll be talking to you about the thrill of a lifetime. Well, I think the thrill of my lifetime was when I went to Queensland. My family doesn't really go on many holidays and we hadn't even been out of New South Wales. The holiday went for one week. We went to Movie World, we went on the Batman ride and saw, the, and saw all the cartoon characters. We also went to SeaWorld, we went on the corkscrew which was a roller coaster that took 10 seconds and you had to line up for 30, second, 30 minutes and it wasn't really worth it. We also went on the pirate ship and the ride the Bermuda Triangle which was new. On the second last day we went to the Corumban Bird Sanctuary which wasn't very fun. Well, the highlight of my the holiday that I went on was when I got to swim with the dolphins at SeaWorld. Thank you. On the topic of thrill of a lot of fun, Eva. Um, good morning, Lou Eight. Today I'd like to talk to you about um, the thrill of a lifetime. Well, I really can't say there's anything in my lifetime that I've called a thrill because, I mean, I look after my little baby sister and she one time I was had my best friend over and she went through my mum's makeup and put it all over her walls and all over her quilt cover and it took me the next two days to get it out and I wouldn't call that a thrill and that's one of the main things in my life that I've got to look after every single weekend. Um, I've once been on a roller coaster when I was three and wanted to jump out so I wouldn't call a roller coaster a thrill. Um, I was also on a, one of those Ferris wheels at, I think I was four, and at the air cup, and at the, very, that at the very top, it stopped, and I decided to freak out and almost jumped off, but my mum my mom saved me. And I've never been on a roller coaster or a, um, um, anything to do with that ever again. I also wouldn't call thrill, school a thrill because, I mean, maths and science are probably the worst subjects. In, in, and maths I can't even understand. And science, I always get yelled at by the sooty, calling me a goose. And if I spill something, every single day it happens, he calls me a goose. I don't know why he calls me a goose, but who knows. So I really don't think there's anything in life that is a thrill. I mean, who would call maths and science having a little baby sister or going on a roller coaster a thrill? Thank you. The winner of the Year 7 public speaking this year was Kate Masters, who narrowly defeated Arwen Wilson um, because of her impromptu speech. Her impromptu speech was very good. So she was the overall winner on the day, although Arwen had the better prepared speech. So those two girls ought to be commended and and we'll be using them in the future for public speaking. Thank you. We're going to download our second year in the house. Oops, sorry, my country. You're probably wondering what I just said then. Well, you're about to find out because today I'm going to talk to you about the Philippines. We're going to download our second year in the house meaning good morning to you all, which is Tagalog, and is the language that is used in the Philippines. And English is also spoken throughout the country, and so many other dialects is also used. Philippines was discovered by Ferdinand Magellan, a Portuguese seafarer, in March 16, 1521. Philippines was named after King Philip II of Spain. A 7,100 Archipelago. If you don't know what I is, you go and better dig the books because. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Archipelago meaning a reef of many islands. Three thousand other islands are yet not to be named. English Philippines is located below Japan and above New Guinea. The islands are linked into three: the Sun, the Sides, and Mindanao. I live in the sun. I, I was born in the sun, not too far away from Manila, the capital city. The country is populated by 60 million people. 
There are over 1,800 different types of animals and 10,000 different plants. Over half of the Philippine landmass is covered with forests. This makes that the Philippines is one of the most wooden, wooden land on the present, that is. Strong earthquakes are fairly rare in the Philippines. Tremors from time to time. One of the worst earthquakes to strike the Philippines this century hit part of the country in July 16, 1999, measuring 7.7 .7 on the Richter scale. That killed over 1,600 people and destroyed over 20,000 buildings. Several strong aftershocks damaged the road and buildings. There, there are at least 37 volcanoes, but 17 which are active. Luzon and northern Visayas lie under typhoon, typhoon belt. That is also a destroyer. <laughs> Philippines has many rulers and many claimers, like the Muslims, and Spanish, US, Japan, and many more. The Philippines fought and struggled for freedom and independence, and not too far away, they got the independence they needed. I used to live in Luzon, called Santa Rosa in Laguna. Laguna. Houses there are mostly made from straws and sticks, either raised from the ground or on the ground, without any floors, carpets, or like here in Australia. There's only one room which are beds, kitchens, and TVs are all together in one room. Horses are not fairly famous in the Philippines, but mostly tricycles, which are bikes that are attached into two-wheeled carriage, and jeepneys, buses, and all sorts of transportation. The Philippine Airlines is the air, air, to get there. I went on a plane and got here. I thought that I was an alien when I got here. People are different houses and famous people that I thought of. Back in the Philippines, there are much more than you think. Much more white people. Philippines is a country they call paradise. When you came there, people will greet you in many ways. And people will also give you respect. When I, when I came over here, my parents and my family thought, geez, Sheila would be famous when she got there. She meets lots of friends in different schools. But they're wrong. They're just the same as others. But different, different life. Thank you. That concludes my speech. The Mile Creek Massacre. The reason why this particular case was a topic of high interest for all historians was because it was the first case where Europeans were tried and hung for killing Aborigines. It is early June, 1838. Location, Mile Creek on the Liverpool Plain. At the sheep run owned by Henry Danger, some friendly Aboriginals were camped. The manager was away working with some of the Aborigines, and so the station was empty of any whites. Between June the 9th and 10th, 28 of these Aborigines were rounded up, roped together, taken behind the hill, and butchered for no apparent reason by 12 stockmen who had entered the property. Later, the 12 stockmen returned and burned the bodies they had destroyed. The manager reported the murders when he came back, and for this was later dismissed. Governor Gibbs received specific instructions from London on the killing of Aborigines, and so was forced to take action on this case. He attained enough information so that almost all the stockmen were successfully tracked down, with the 
with the exception of the leader, who, with aid, escaped being caught. The trial in Sydney brought about phenomenal and new results in a world that needed a good stir in this particular department. The 11 stockmen were easy, easily and predictably acquitted because of a small technicality. 20 minutes was all it took for the jury to consider their verdict, a verdict which was welcomed with cheers from the spectators. One member of the jury, quoted in the Australian, said, I look on the blacks as a set of monkeys, and the sooner they are exterminated from the face of the earth, the better. I knew the men were guilty of murder, but I'd never see a white man hanged for killing a black. The four alleged murderers were let off. However, seven were retried on a matter connected with the Marquis charge and were found guilty. They were hung before Christmas, much to the outrage of Sydney residents, who were used to a much more biased legal system, which they had kidded themselves into believing was right. Angry people argued that this would only encourage and promote further such incidents and outrages from the blacks. A minority of the population were in favour of this result, but they were mere voices in the wilderness, for by far the majority were steaming with fury at this event, which made a huge difference in the, in the run of things to come. This could be considered a change for the better, but let's not forget how it all started. The point is that 28 free and totally innocent men, women, children and babies were killed for no other clear reason but for the pure joy the stockmen attained by murdering, as they called them, worthless animals. Also, the satisfied kick they got out of having power over other people's lives. It is no lie that these men were indeed <coughs> insane. They had been mentally warped by a society that could not bear the thought of an egalitarian system. And it was this racist law that cost 28 people their lives. And in that, and that, in my opinion, is a true tragedy. I'll meet with the topic, the wonder of communication. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today I'll speak to you on the wonders of communication. We as a whole live in a world full of gizmos and gadgets used to connect and convey lots of information, knowledge and straight out gossip to other people. Two gizmos used for transmitting information, filth and lies are the commonly used telephone and pager. The telephone is a useful machine used for conveying strong emotions over a long distance. For example, a wife being her husband, who's on a business trip to Hawaii, telling him how she left the tap running, flooding the house and consequently drowning their cat. <laughs> More often though, it's a means of spreading rumour, gossip and starting smear campaigns. My sister's often on the phone for hours, talking to friends she saw two hours earlier, and her justification for this is, it only costs 25 cents each call, but after 50 calls it does add up. The pager is an unperfected wonder of communication, for it suffers a dreadful disease. Just as the lover's lips met, from the shadows crept the dreadful, wicked, spike like baron, and from his cloak he whisked a glistening dagger, and then beep, beep. <laughs> this is a common occurrence for the pager, prone to beeping in the climactic stages of movies or shows. However, though these are modern marvels of communication, I'm not here as a junior sales rep for Telstra Australia. What I'm really here to talk to you about is the mysterious means of correspondence used by babies, animals and headmasters. All fairly similar creatures, are they not? <laughs> Have you ever wondered what animals talk about? Stay with me though you may think me a wacko. For I believe animals don't just talk, they chat. I've noticed two dogs from down the street that have particularly interesting conversations. <laughs> These two dogs have sniffed and whittled their way through. And it's a common sight to see their backside waddling down the street. Arnie, the Dalmatian, is trim, strong, wild and silly, while James the Labrador is rotund, forgetful and plain out stupid. <laughs> the walk's conversation mainly consists of toilet humour and much chuckling in dopey voices. 
Apart from the incessant telling of jokes, the only other conversing happens when Arnie points out another telegraph pole or grass needing excavating. <laughs> Consequently, Arnie has marked out one of the largest territories I've ever seen in my life. Just as animals have mysterious means of communication, so do we humans. Consider the deputy principle. We all know the feeling of the deputy's glare, the stare causing you to melt at the knees and resort to tears and incomprehensible mutterings like, but sir, it wasn't me. <laughs> the common unrefined uses of this art are teenage couples that are going out. They have a weak conversational link, each partner standing a good 10 metres away and casting meaningful glances in the direction of their partner. <laughs> because of their lack of experience, this invisible love intercom is subject to many blackouts, often causing mass panic and causing the couple to break up. My last example is the baby, whose communicative powers exceed their age. They communicate by simple means. You've all probably seen the look of concentration on a baby's face that tells you, even before your nose does, that their nappy will need changing before two. <laughs> Other signals are that evil little contented chuckle or the full-blooded yelling for joy. The wonders of communication makes us think of faxes, telephones, pages, modems and the internet. But do these things communicate anything more than words? Unlike the unspoken message of the two dogs as they wander the neighbourhood or the baby's cry of delight as it prepares to devour the blowfly. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the words of the old song might be right. It ain't what you say, but the way that you say it. Now that I've gave you a brief idea of what the three main types of child abuse are, 
I'd like to tell you what 22 students at Barrow High thought was the most commonly done to the children and who did it to them. Verbal abuse was said to be the most commonly done, with 12 out of the whole 22 people saying it was done by parents and peers. It needs to be stopped. Physical abuse was voted second with eight people saying that it was done most common. Sadly, all said parents. So that leaves us with sexual abuse. Only two people thought that it was most commonly done. It does happen more. I wish I could say more on the subject. Uh, if I had all day, I would. But with limited time, I have to stop here. If you want to know more on child abuse, go to your local library and look, and look up child abuse or child welfare. Thank you for listening to my speech. And remember, it does happen in our society.
Number one, there was a family of two girls, the mother and the father. The mother went to work at night while the father stayed home and minded the girls. At night he creeped into the girls' room and sexually abused them. He ended up getting the older girl pregnant and made her have an abortion and the younger girl is now in a psychiatric ward. The other story is a young girl was sexually molested by entrusted friends of the family. They made her touch them and force themselves upon her. She couldn't cope with the abuse and turned to a life of drug and alcohol abuse and later on prostitution because she was afraid that nobody would believe her and the people threatened to kill her parents if she told. It was only two years later that she told her parents and by then it was too late to do anything about it except that maybe she got some of her self-esteem back. If these people had told someone, I don't think they would have had to go through some of the emotional struggles by themselves. Physical abuse is normally the child hasn't done anything wrong and something has set the offender off which could lead to the child being locked in a cupboard or belted with a strap. Physical abuse not only happens to older children but can also happen to babies or toddlers. For example, to suffocate a newborn baby because it won't stop crying or a toddler was putting hot scalding water up to her ribs because she dirtied her nappy. Now how low can these parents get? Why should anyone have to go through those kinds of experiences? If you've had anything of these things happen to you or seen anything like these, you should report it to the authorities because it's a criminal offence. Nobody deserves to be treated like animals except for the people who inflicted this pain. Mental abuse is telling someone they're useless, no good, or can never amount to anything, etc. We use mental and physical abuse all the time when taking our feelings out on people, and it's wrong. It hurts them and it can really damage their self esteem. Here is a poem written by Peggy Seeger called Emily, which captures the sexual, physical, and mental abuse of a, of a young girl. Here's how it goes. The next time he lifted his hand against me, I thought I provoked him. I was to blame. The next time, the next time, and the time after, I told no one, because I was ashamed. The doctor says he needs my understanding. Please settle a question, the man in his home. Everyone knows him, no one defends me. After the altar, a woman's alone. This poem shows the side that adults do get away with things because they're older. And why should anyone listen to a little kid? The offender usually makes the child feel guilty or threatens them in some way to make them keep quiet. And when the child is old enough to realise what's going on, they think they're the ones who cause it, so they don't say anything, believing it's their fault. If anybody is being abused, either physically, sexually or mentally, I encourage you to tell someone. Let them be ashamed, not you. Thank you. Devils and demons. <laughs> Teachers of Year 8, fellow students, today I'm going to talk to you all about devils and demons. The belief in evil spirits is probably as old as the human race itself and is based on the fear of the unknown. In the past, many illnesses, including mental disorders, have been blamed on evil spirits who were supposedly constant at war with mankind. They were led by Satan, a super demon also known as the monarch of hell. Satan is usually pictured as a horrifying monster with huge saucer-shaped eyes, talons, cloven hooves, and a forked tail. Satan will camouflage himself as a dragon, goat, pig or dog, and even a housefly just to deceive mankind. He commanded an immense army of lesser demons. Clergymen, were constantly warning people of Satan's many attempts to lure him away from God. One of his methods was to offer wealth or power in exchange for their immortal souls. They would sell their souls by signing a docu document with their own blood. They would then become his slaves forever. Satan loathed priests, for they put people on their guard against his assault. In revenge, he sent some of the worst demons ever to harass parsons and monks. Witches were Satan's most faithful agents. They were feared by everyone for their known ability to kill humans and animals with black, black magic. A witch could be either man or woman, though usually a woman. A person became a witch by selling their soul to the devil or by walking around the parish church nine times anti-clockwise at midnight. A huge horned toad would be waiting at the end of the north door to initiate him or her into witchcraft. Satan always provided the witch with a familiar or imp, usually a small demon in disguise as a cat or ferret. The familiar would make sure that the witch obeyed Satan's every command. 
A witch will cast a spell by stirring her cauldron anti-clockwise whilst muttering magical words. Some demons were thought to take possession of a body and drive him or her insane. <coughs> They're extremely skilled at getting into the body without being noticed, such as hiding in the folds of a lettuce leaf and being swallowed. The only way a devil could be driven from the body was by the ritual of exorcism. Exorcism is a religious ceremony performed by priests with holy water and prayers. Once the devil has been driven from the body, the north doors of the church are open. These are sometimes known as devil's doors, and you can still see them in some old churches, though they are usually ripped over. Many people, even today, are afraid of the dark, deserted places and graveyards, for the fear that it may be haunted by a ghost. People used to have the same fears about devils and demons. However, over the last 200 years, our understanding of the world has widened and devils and demons are no longer taken so seriously. This concludes my talk for this morning. Thank you. With attention deficit disorder, it's over. <laughs> Most parents of children who are about to enter school, the question that's most in their mind is, is my child going to school? They are worried about whether their child will make friends and whether they can tie their shoelaces or not. The parents of children who have asked, the question that's most in their mind is, is this school ready for my child? ADD stands for Attention Deficit Disorder, and is more commonly known as ADS. ADS is a chemical deficiency of the brain. So when I say that, it's probably thinking retard, but that's not right at all. Most ads kids are very intelligent, they just have trouble concentrating and behaving, and this can often make them seem dim. A lot of ads kids have trouble socialising, and this leads to low self-esteem, which can become very dangerous. To pretend for a moment that your brain is like a car battery, this battery works on the basis that electrodes are sent through the liquid in the battery to start start the engine. If the liquid is low or not there, the electrodes can't be sent, and the engine won't start or work properly. This is what it's like in the brain of an ad kid. Chemical, chemical that tells you how to act and behave is missing. There are two drugs that can replace this chemical, but only for a few hours at a time. The first is Ritalin, and the second is dexamphetamine. You don't take both these drugs, just the one that helps you the most. In some cases, ads kids also take cataphrase to help control hyperactivity. There's a lot of criticism about ads, saying that it's overdiagnosed, over and to an extent, this is true. Many doctors could diagnose ads because it's easy and a lot of parents just blame, blame their bratty kids on ads. But it's not fair to say that all diagnoses are false and that the drugs don't work. I can say that the drugs do work. Two years ago, my little brother Jarrah went on Ritalin. At the time, he belonged to no sporting or musical group and had no self-esteem at all. Can you imagine being eight years old, having no friends, having no one to talk to, having about all the birthday plans and never being invited to one? what it was like for Jared. Twelve months ago, Jared went on catapress to, on catapress to control his hyperactivity. Before this, he often went into violent rages for no reason at all. After two years of being on the Ritalin, Jared has improved a great deal. He's played soccer all season and has just finished a musical computer course here at our school. He has a few stable friends that are learning to cope with his ads. He went to his first birthday party in years one month ago. I asked Jared what it was like to have ads, and he said, well, it's hard to concentrate in class and hard to make more friends because they don't understand me. But now I have a few friends who do understand, it's okay. Now Jared has the social aspect of his ads worked out, he has to work on his hyperactivity and hopefully will succeed. Ads used to be a nightmare for Jared, now it's just part of everyday, everyday life and something he has to strive to conquer. Thank you. Or jobs in most cases. You can go to the movies and to the beach. 
When you're older, you don't have the same freedom, although in a lot of other ways you do have freedom. You may think that your parents don't give you freedom staying at home, but when you get older, you're going to realise that the freedom that you have is young. When you're young, is a lot better than the freedom that you're going to have when you're old. Um, you have, when you're younger, you have a lot more freedom. I don't think that you can waste it on the young. Older people can still be useful, but not in the same way that we can. They can't go to the beach every day. They can't go to movies every day. They have to sustain a stable job so that they can support themselves. They don't live at home with their parents who give them money every time they want to go out. In conclusion, I have to leave this with you. Youth belongs to whoever makes it theirs. Thank you. Driving, 
nightclubs, voting, independence, etc. But then again, we should value the time we have now to do what we can and do it well. We already have lost the ability to run around in dress up clothes, roll on the dog grass, and let chocolate cake smear all over our faces. <coughs> Not chocolate face cake smear all over our faces. <coughs> but we shouldn't let this hold us back. Many adults <laughs> Many adults you hear also don't regret losing their childhood and welcome their adult years as a time to mature and grow out of their childhood ways. But do not but do not forget that it's when when you do regret it it's always too late to go back. <laughs>
Year 8 fellow students. Today I've been given the topic of Youth is Wasted on the Young. Many old people look back on their childhood days and wish that they had um, done a lot more things. Some people take um, being young for granted and don't do a lot of the things that they could do. Younger people are a lot more energetic and um, have a lot more energy to play sports and things. Um, they can go out to the movies a lot. And when people are older, they sometimes think that they've wasted a lot of their time on just mucking around and sitting at home in front of the TV or something when they could have been out. Um, well, that's about all I can think of. So <laughs> this concludes my talk. So thank you. for the entertainment of year eight, if you'd all like to turn around and look to the back, you with the long hair that have been slapping yourself across the face, would you just like to stand up and show us how you do that? Now, after three, let's just see you do that so that I can catch it on video and send it away. Okay? Congratulate all those people because you're engaged 
last Monday, perhaps a little bit better than you were today. <laughs> I'd like to congratulate you. When we thought of this idea five, six years ago, it wasn't principally for a person to come out and say this person's won this competition. It was to get everyone involved in public speaking. I think it's been a great success. I know with my class, everyone got up and spoke to the best of their ability. They were well prepared. They spoke in the same way as these people without a variety of subjects. There are so many interesting things out there to speak about. I commend those people who are willing to take the risk and speak about things personal to them, such as, if I may, um, where is she? Amber speaking about a brother's uh, condition, about the two girls uh, speaking about child abuse. These are rather controversial subjects. I thought they handled them with maturity. They did a fine job, but we expected that. We expected that they would do a fine job. Just as I know from adjudicating my, adjudicating my <coughs> class, they did a good job as well. These people represented you very proudly. Remember, it's hard to, it's hard to remember back a week, I suppose, but the way the adjudication goes, last week's and this week's is marked out of the same number of marks. So you have to take that into consideration. A prepared speech, of course, is just that, prepared. Perhaps they've been home um, practicing with brothers and sisters, mums and dads, budgery go, I don't know, the mirror, to try, and, to try and get their speech, to get the confidence to deliver it. What I was impressed though with these people, in their prepared speech, they didn't have a rehearsed flavour about it. Although they knew what they were going to say, they came out here and led the audience to believe that they were making, not making up as they went along, but there was something fresh about their speech. It wasn't just reading palm cards in a rehearsed way. If I remember rightly, I think it was Ben Romney said something, if I may just paraphrase him, it ain't what you say, it's how you say it. And that also has to be taken into consideration when it comes to public speaking. The content's important, but the delivery is important also. And I'd like to commend these people once again. Their delivery was fine. They engaged you. You were interested in listening to what they had to say. The task today is a much more challenging one. To go out with Mr. Carl for five minutes and prepare a speech on such a challenging topic as youth is wasted on the young, I think it's a, it'd be a challenging topic for people much older than these young people. May I say this, that when it comes to impromptu speaking, it has to have some content. You can't simply rely on just engaging the audience, maybe with a joke or something like that, but you have to say something. When it comes to impromptu speaking for you people, and for people who have just spoken, if you can come to two or three points that you can develop in that one or two minutes, you've done as much as you can do in five minutes preparation. We know, and I guess the people here know, some got a little lost. It was hard for them to find some things that they could focus on for one to two minutes. I think the speaker who spoke perhaps better than any other speaker in the impromptu did just as I said. We were able to choose, I'm trying to not select a gender here, to hold your suspense a little longer, two or three points that were developed. And it was just enough, I think, <coughs> to tip the decision in favour of Amy Donaldson. <laughs> Keystone Cops and Charlie Chaplin. Especially with the Keystone Cops, their near deaths and fatalities was the most funny thing. After this came talking movies, which were still in black and white. Some of the main people were the Three Stooges, Laura and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, and their mishaps and misfortunes and mistakes was what was funny. <coughs> the 
the latest crazy for saying comedy is stand up. Everybody do. Some of the main people are Jim Jamal, Billy Connolly, Steady Eddie, and Jerry Seinfeld. Nowadays there's TV that's a lot, lot of comedy shows such as Seinfeld, Mr. Bean, and Mad About You and other things like that. Most comedy is tells jokes, riddles. And comedy has a therapeutical side to it. For someone who is down or not feeling happy, you could tell them some jokes. They could laugh at it and get happy and hence the saying laugh, the whole world laughs with you and cry and you cry alone. Thanks.
Bradley will now be talking on vandalism. Welcome ladies, gentlemen and boys and girls. I'm here today to speak about vandalism. The willful act of destruction to public or private property, especially of anything beautiful or artistic. The spoiling or malicious damage of something artistic or cultural achievement. This disrupts vandalism to a T. There are many different types of vandalism, ranging from spray painting, knowingly ruining another person's reputation, damaging cars and also knowingly polluting our waterways. I could go on forever but I won't. Today I will start with spray painting. Spray artists can do a lot of great artwork with their spray paints, but some just waste their time and talent. I don't think vandalism should, is right to be on other people's property, or public property for that matter. I also think that if they had a legal place to do their art, you would find that our streets would become cleaner. The majority of the spray painting group spray paint walls in public and private property to impress their friends or relatives. And some do put ads in the newspapers and yellow pages to get hired, but mainly, but mainly from companies that wish to decorate the wall. For example, if it is a tire business or company, they will hire the artist and ask them to write the name of the company and then draw a picture of a car with big wheels. Now I think I'll move on to the next topic, which is knowingly ruining another person's reputation. This type of vandalism is called verbal vandalism. This vandalism is the most disappointing type of vandalism. It is when you insult somebody's name. As an example, let's say Jane Lane. A person or enemy so could say Jane is a pain or something's worse. I won't repeat that. I won't say that. I won't. I think I'll start on this topic, which is damaging cars. Most of the cars that get done are stolen. After they are stolen, they are taken paddock bashing and then burnt out to destroy all signs that they have been in the car. But first they usually take radios, doors, etc. But this is not always the case. The other case is a tube bobbing car. This is when a person runs a key or a coin along the side of the car, also kicking the candles in and smashing the windows. They can also let the tyres down. Now we'll go to the last topic, which is knowingly polluting our waterways. This is when a person or people decide to throw things in the water, such as waste from a factory floor or just plain rubbish. And this is what would have to be one of the worst types of vandalism in my books. Just think, they're not only polluting our waterways, they are also killing our wildlife. That is either wildlife that either drink or live in the water. Please think twice before you vandalise them. Kessie will be talking about legalising marijuana. <laughs> Good morning ladies and gentlemen. I'm here today to talk to you about decriminalisation of marijuana. I believe marijuana should be decriminalised. Marijuana is presently an illegal drug everywhere in Australia besides ACT in South Australia. Marijuana is a plant grown from a small seed. Marijuana is listed by horticultural societies as a noxious weed. The plant can be dried and smoked. Marijuana can be addictive, but not as addictive as nicotine, alcohol, or other subscribed drugs. It also has many uses, such as material for clothes, thread, which can be turned into rope, and pulp for use for paper. It is believed that one third of the population has or will smoke marijuana. Marijuana has less long-term effect mentally or physically on your body than any other illegal or subscribed drug, or than a lot of. <laughs> it's believed that cigarettes and alcohol do more damage to your body than marijuana. Marijuana can be grown without THC, which is uh, uh, something that's contained in it. <laughs> <We're expecting laughs> <laughs> Probably the most important use for marijuana is its medical properties. Marijuana has many medical uses, including a mild painkiller for things such as headaches, migraines, um, part treatment in long-term or chronic illness such as cancer, um, and it can be used to counter hyperactiveness and a mild stress relief. On the other hand, small petty cases for marijuana charges are cramming our courts. Taxpayers are paying for pathetic fines while murder is awaiting for trial. Taxpayers would rather see murder is jailed than marijuana smokers fined. Marijuana is a safe, effective way of reading some dangerous prescription drugs. If marijuana is not as bad for you as some legal drugs, why not legalise it? Thank you. Thank you. I'm judging people on appearances. 
Teachers and fellow students, the topic I have chosen to speak to you about today is judging people by appearance. My opinion on this topic is that people should not be judged by their appearance because you cannot tell what a person's character is like, how rich or poor someone is, or whether someone is good or bad, <laughs> something just by looking at them. You cannot tell what a person's character is like just by their appearance. For instance, someone may look very stuck up, but if you take the time to go past their appearance and start to chat with them, you may find that they are just as friendly as many other people. By looking at someone's house or car, you cannot tell what their financial situation is. For example, some people may have big, extremely beautiful houses, yet they may be very in debt. On the other hand, someone may have a little bummy car, but they may have a stack of money just sitting in a bank account waiting to be used. Or maybe those people just don't like fancy cars. Also, those people may have many other assets of one sort or another in other locations. Another example is people that wear name brand clothes. This does not necessarily mean that they are rich. They may have been present for occasions such as Christmas or birthdays. If people do not wear name brand clothes, this does not mean we are to automatically assume that they are on the bottom end of the income chain. An example of this is my mother. If you took one look at what she wears outside of school hours, you would put your head down and walk the other way, and there's no way in the world you would think her occupation is pretty bad. Judging whether people are good or bad at something is a thing that many people do, and even though looks can often be deceiving, they still continue to do it. You cannot tell what a person is capable of <coughs> just by their size, shape, race, sex or colour. Take a larger than average person in a sporting event, for example. People just think, oh, don't worry about him or her. He or she's too fat to be able to do anything anyway. But then again, that person may be very accomplished at it. There is no difference to what a person can do just because of what colour they are. A black person is just as capable of painting a wall as a white person. There are some areas in which the opposite sex cannot perform as well as the other, but there are many areas <laughs> in which the other sex is discriminated against. An example of this is that men are often considered macho, tough and strong. But nowadays, women are just as strong and able to withstand the things that men do, such as lifting something heavy or defending themselves against someone who attacks them. But a woman capable of doing such things then brings on another stereotype image to herself, that is one of being a butch. <laughs> one last thing is that people are, if people are going to take you for what you look like and not who you are, then they are not worth worrying about and they need to take a good look inside themselves and realise that the best looking people aren't even perfect before they go placing degrading tags on other people. Because like the old saying goes, you can't judge a book by its cover. It's the same with people, you can't judge them by their appearance. Thank you. <laughs> this criminal is speaking about for them. <laughs> In essence, there is one factor that makes the Pridhams the Pridhams. We're all totally insane. And from that factor, everything spirals out. Everyone and everything is a psychopath. My parents, the ones who started the legacy, live in a dreamland of their own. And in this dreamland, there is a certain pecking order. That is, the parents equals gods. No laws apply to them. When they are at, when they are at home, they rule. They are justice, judge and jury. They are the rulers of Marimba and no one stands in their way, except for maybe the cat. I sometimes have to wonder what that cat knows to be treated so well by my parents. My cat must, must be the only cat in the world that has been knighted. Her lady, <coughs> Grey, has her power because my father is so fond of her. She is blind in one eye, she has only three teeth and she seems to have lost a few too many brain cells. Between the hours of six and seven in the morning, though, she is wined, dined, and talked to by my father. Their conversation ranges from meow to meow meow, and on the mornings when they are both feeling amiable, meow meow meow. <laughs> this all occurs when I am trying to sleep, and let me assure you now, meowing is not a quiet act in our household. The other animals, however, are not outdone by the cat. No. We have a range of animals with a range of mental disorders. <laughs> the one with the most amount of problems has to be Chester, my dog. 
Jessica was dropped on his head as a puppy. <laughs> and we think that must, have, that must have caused his lack of intelligence. We tried to put him through some sort of basic training, like six, but we never succeeded. We decided to let him roam free and he could be what he wanted to be, even if that was a raving lunatic. So now he spends his time running around in circles, barking at my pair of guinea pigs. <laughs> my least favourite pet would have to be my mother's mouse. I hate him because he smells. <laughs> Sometimes my mother will take him out of his cage and when you walk into, this room, into the room, a smell will sort of reach out and punch you in the face. It is truly vile. The strange thing about this is, though, my mother can't smell it. She thinks that his body odour is non-existent and that somehow we are jealous of the mouse and that is why we try to slander him. But no, there's still, that's still not all. We have two other fine specimens, a sheep and a goat. The goat thinks it's a horse. I don't know why, it just does. You call out here, horsey, 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 and a moment later, two horses will appear, closely followed by a goat trying to keep up. And then there's the sheep. One little sheep. This sheep owns its own paddock. Why? Because everyone else is too scared of it. It patrols the border fences, and when any other animal comes in, it sort of bars a warning. And if you still keep on advancing, you soon find you have a sheep heading towards you at a very fast rate. And it won't stop until you're too far away. Many a time, my brother has encouraged people to go and pat the nice little sheepy. <laughs> so in they go, with a handful of hay, and then, a few moments later, out they come, still with a handful of hay, but also with a fast-moving sheep. <laughs> but back to some humans. My mother is a technological moron. <laughs> it is the computer that worries her the most. Every weekend, she has something she wants typed up. So she'll stride into my room, sit down at my desk, and look expectantly at the computer. And then she'll get a sort of dazed look on her face as, he, as she tries to remember just which button it is that turns it on. <laughs> I have now labelled the power button with a large green arrow. But when she gets into it, and then she's had it. She knows that somewhere in the process, you have to click on something. What? She's not quite sure. So after clicking on everything on the screen and pressing every button, she will turn off the computer and walk out, declaring that she can write it by hand. You may be wondering why I never mention myself in this household's maniac society. Well, that is because I am in a stage of denial. My brother and I are still holding on to the faint hope that we are adopted. <coughs> but slowly, as the years go past, that hope is fading. Their evil influence is beginning to wear off on us. Occasionally, we find ourselves wearing odd socks or laughing at visitors being chased around by a mad sheep. So we pinch ourselves and try to snap out of it. But it is happening more and more. And someday, we're going to wake up and have a mad desire to go and talk to the cat. Yes, my brother and I know we are becoming freedoms. Keep right running at home. Who's winning this? Who's freedom? Yeah, but who do you want to win? Hannah. Hannah. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe in the impromptu. We're going to do our song, Hannah. We're going to do a song now. Yeah. 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 Will be the thrill of a lifetime. Each speaker has had five minutes to prepare and will speak for two minutes. Their warning with Bell will be at one and a half minutes. Chris Pigeon will discuss. <laughs> They gave me this topic, the thrill of a lifetime. The thrill of a lifetime for me would be doing a deed with Pamela Anderson. Or maybe getting my smart such as I've been there. Maybe become a movie star. The day are all dreams. The real thrill of a lifetime would be bungee jumping. Or diving, deep diving down the sea. Or going on those jet boats through the rocks. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, they were, they were, they were.
more nervous than Liz. Always the, the, the 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 because she's afraid. She's your friend. Yeah. Yeah. And I think she should be, yeah. What about you girls? Is there anyone? Who's your best competition? Who's she been challenged by? What's the pattern? exactly what I was expecting, so just bear with us. Okay, what would you consider to be the thrill of a lifetime? The school burning, the school being closed for due to contamination of rats, which some unearthly person put in there, or, or Mrs. Brennan having a heart attack. <laughs> jump at a school, most would consider it's a bad idea. So, in all honesty, will we miss school? Most of us would answer this right now saying no. Others would say, well, I want my school certificate, the high one too, so I'm going to say I will miss school. Um, having, the, having the thrill of a life, could this be considered a bad thing as well? Having a lovely day out, Luna Park, Wonderland, the other one, what is it? I don't know what it is. Anyway. One of those fun parts. Anyway, coming back and finding your mother dead. Is this a good thrill or a bad thrill? Would this send you into, ha into convulsions as well, from the shock of it all? Anyway, bad thrills aren't as good as some... As, well, bad thrills aren't as good as good thrills, some would say, but other people would say it's very good. I'm going to end now because I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maturity level seek their thrills of how large a girl's cleavage is. 